All right, well, it's so good to be with you today, and uh, I am with the uh, Institute for Creation Research, and I just, it, I, I love my job most of the time, <laughs> but uh, I, I love the fact that I get to come and share with folks that God's Word is true from the beginning, and that's the topic that I want to address today, uh, the fact that your origins matter, what you believe about creation and evolution, what you believe about the origin of life, the origin of humanity, it really matters in terms of some of these other issues that we have to deal with as a society. There are, there are some issues, I think, that you would agree with that we have to deal with as a society, maybe some that we don't care for very much. And I want you to consider, for example, the uh, United States of America. We have the most churches, the most seminaries, the most Christian colleges, Christian resources, Christian media, television, radio of any nation. And for all of those Christian resources, would you say we're becoming more Christian every day or less Christian every day? Well, that's everywhere I go, people say that. It seems like we're rapidly becoming a pagan nation. Now, how is that? How is it that for all of these Christian resources, we're becoming a pagan nation? What is going on? What's happening? And is this related to creation? I, I suggest it is. And in fact, I'm going to suggest there's a very strong connection between Genesis and all these other issues that we're having today in our society. And, and the real issue of all that, that, that's the foundational to all of these issues and is also foundational to creation versus evolution is the issue of God's word versus man's word. That's really what it comes down to. If God's word is true, you got creation. If man's word is true, if man independent from God determines truth, then the most popular view would be evolution through millions of years of one kind changing into another and so on. And really all of the issues, all of the social issues that we deal with in our culture, every problem you can think of in our society can be traced back to a broken law of God. Every single one where we've decided we're not going to listen to God's word. We're going to do it. We know better than God. We're going to do it our way. And that leads to problems inevitably because God is God and we're not. And this has been an issue since creation. God created Adam and Eve. He told them, if you eat from that tree, you will surely die, right? And, that, and uh, the way it's worded in Hebrew, of course, is very interesting. It indicates that the process of death would immediately begin at the moment they ate that forbidden fruit. And, and that's what, exactly what they did. They decided, we're not going to listen to your word. We're going to determine truth for ourselves. And today, they're dead. God was right. They were wrong. How about that? That's always the way it is. And uh, we're descended from Adam and Eve. We have that same sin nature we want to trust in, man's word rather than God's word. And I want to suggest to you that that's the problem with the decline of Christian America. We've rejected the Bible as the word of God. And you know what? Most, most of the attacks on God's word are in Genesis. That's the place where people start and they say, you can't trust the Bible because we know it, even the beginning, God didn't even get the beginning right. <laughs> we know millions of years of evolution is the way life came about. Not creation and certainly not creation in six days, right? That's what you hear. And people say, you know, science has disproved the Bible. Science has proven that that Genesis, that's just a myth. Adam and Eve, that's just a, that's just a myth. Nobody believes that anymore. Instead, we're taught that millions of years of evolution is the way that life came about. And by the way, when I use the word evolution, that's, that's what I'm referring to, this idea that single-celled organisms, something like bacteria, eventually became all the different uh, kinds of life that we see on Earth today, including you and uh, and if it, I'm not just using, you know, sometimes the word evolution just means change. We all agree things change. The world was once a paradise, and today it's not. Things have changed. The question is what kind of change is possible, and I don't believe in this particular type of change. I certainly think you can get different breeds of dogs and things like that. We observe that. That's good science. But we don't observe bacteria becoming people, <clears throat> and I don't think we'll ever observe that. But in the evolutionary view, you are related to a turnip. That's your distant cousin. And in fact, I was speaking to a group of atheists one time, and I mentioned that. I said, you know, in the, in, in the view you hold, your distant cousin is a turnip. And somebody afterwards said, weren't you kind of poking fun at us a little bit? You know, and I said, well, isn't that what you believe? He said, well, yeah. And I said, well, there you go then, right? I said, I'm not, you know, if, if you think it sounds silly, maybe you ought to reconsider your belief. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just reflecting back to you your philosophy. Anyway, um, this is not what God tells us, right? This is man's word about how life could come about without God. God has a much different version. And of course, what you believe about origins will have consequences. If Adam is in your past, if God made you, then he owns you and he's got the right to make the rules. If ape is in your past, if you're just a cosmic accident, then you own yourself. You make your own rules, right? And so you end up with relative morality. And that, boy, we're seeing that today, aren't we? I get to determine my own truth. That's a very popular sentiment today, but it's not at all uh, biblical. It's not true. 
If creation's in your past, certain, certain logical truths will stem from that. On the other hand, if evolution were true, certain logical truths would stem from that. For example, if creation is true, you'd expect to have laws because there's a lawgiver. God made us, and so he's got the right to make laws for us. He made us in his image. He'll hold us accountable for our actions. He's revealed himself to us, so we know what his standards are. And so we'd expect to have marriage, for example. Where does the idea of marriage come from? This idea of a man and a woman being united by God for life? That goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? That's a Genesis theme. In fact, really, every major Christian doctrine you can think of goes back to Genesis. And in generally, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. It's that important. Why is it we have standards? Standards of clothing, for example. I noticed you're all wearing clothes today. I appreciate that. I'm sure you do, too. <laughs> Um, where does that, because it wasn't originally that way, but because of sin, you know, God instituted that as a sort of a temporary symbolic covering for sin and so on. Animals don't wear clothes. I mean, see, the Christian worldview can account for that. We can make sense of that. Or uh, why is it that the uh, meaning of life, why is it that human life is so valuable? It's such a tragedy when, when we see somebody die, and that's, and of course, that's different from animal death, isn't it? And we know that. I mean, you might have a hot dog for lunch, in which case you're eating, I'm sorry to say, a dead animal. Probably lots of dead animals, actually, in your hot dog. But uh, anyway, you get the point, right? And that's okay. There's no problem there. But if you were to eat a human, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? Because we're different. We're made in God's image. Animals are not. God cares about animals, too, but not to the same extent that he does those of us who are made in his image. And we can account for that as creationists, we can make sense of that. But you see, if evolution were true, then you have a counterfeit set of standards. Why would you have laws in an evolutionary universe? That's what I want to know. Evolution is supposed to be about the strong dominating over the weak. Then why would you have laws that are designed to protect the weak from the strong? That's what laws are for. They're anti-evolutionary. Laws are anti-evolutionary by their very nature. Or um, why not do what you want with sex, right? I mean, if that's kind of what animals do. Just It's just chemistry, right? Just what animals do. Why not abort babies, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids, if we're just animals, right? Why not? And so you can see how these things would stem from that mindset. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that evolution is the cause of all these social evils that we have in, in the world. Obviously, sin is the cause of the social evils we have in the world. When people decide they're not going to listen to God's word, and they're going to determine truth for themselves. But I am suggesting that evolution gives people a way of trying to rationalize that in their own mind. Because the fact is, if evolution is true, then there isn't a God who is at least not one who's revealed himself in, in Scripture. And you see, what's happened is these evolutionary termites have come in in the minds of people, and they've eroded that foundation. And so people are taught, well, you can't trust the Bible because we know that Genesis isn't remotely true. Adam's just a myth, and, and uh, you know, we know millions of years of evolution is the way that life came about. If that's so, then you're going to have a hard time defending marriage. If Adam and Eve are not real people, if marriage is just a cultural trend, hey, the culture changes. Why shouldn't the definition of marriage change? And that's not just a hypothetical issue. That's exactly what we're seeing in our culture today. Because you see, we've, the way that we've approached some of these issues, we've tried to leave the Bible out of the discussion, and we've tried to argue on other uh, merits, you know, abortion and things like that. But marriage, you really can't defend that apart from Scripture. Honestly, it's because of what God did in Genesis. God instituted the family unit. He did that in Genesis, and that's why marriage is one man and one woman for life. You show me somebody who believes in so-called homosexual marriage, I'll show you somebody who rejects Genesis. Because the moment you accept Genesis, it's a man and a woman for life. It's that simple. And, and by the way, Jesus understood this. When the, when the religious leaders of his time came to him, and, and when he was in his earthly ministry, and they had distorted God's word, and uh, of course... One of, the, one of the ways that they'd done that is they distorted uh, this old doctrine of marriage and divorce in Matthew 19. And Jesus, when he, when he corrected them, he quoted from Genesis 1 and 2. He explained marriage and he explained it from the beginning, from its foundation in Genesis. See, a lot of people today think, well, I don't have time, Dr. Lyle, to deal with origins, this whole Genesis thing. I mean, there, we got bigger fish to fry, right? We get marriages under attack in our culture and so on. There is a connection, though, between the rejection, the increasing rejection of Genesis and the increasing rejection of the doctrines that stem from Genesis. And that makes sense. I mean, the Bible tells us that if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We need to start thinking foundationally in terms of how these Christian doctrines connect back to uh, the very first book of the Bible. 
It used to be in our culture, you could say abortion's wrong, homosexual behavior's wrong, adultery's wrong, etc. People would understand that. They get that because of our common heritage. We have a Christian heritage in this nation. It's a wonderful blessing that we take for granted sometimes. But even unbelievers, even, even those who had not reject, even those who have rejected scripture uh, or rejected Christ still had some degree of respect for the Bible as the word of God. You'll hear people sometimes refer to it as the good book and so on. But, but you see today, because of these attacks on Genesis, our foundation, we find that you, when you say, uh, you know, abortion's wrong, homosexual behavior's wrong, adultery's wrong, people say, not according to my rules, I reject the Bible. That's not my standard. I get to determine truth for myself. And they're on their own little island of, of truth. And, and uh, I'm sad to say many Christians really are standing on the island of man decides truth. They'll embrace the Bible to the extent that it's compatible with the way they want to live. And then they reject the rest. And that's, that's one reason why you'll have Christians, professing Christians, who will say, well, I don't think that Adam's a real person. Yes, I believe in Jesus, but I think Adam's just a, a metaphor containing certain spiritual truth. Right? It's, just, it's, it's a parable or something like that. Well, Genesis is not written as a parable. Jesus did speak in parables sometimes, and it's very clear when he did. Genesis isn't written that way, and you know that, right? You know those verses in Genesis you love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and they begets so-and-so. You know those genealogies that you love to read there? And uh, it actually does help put you to sleep sometimes, but uh, no, God actually put those verses there for a reason. And one of the reasons is it's telling us that these are real people who lived. And they, it tells us the names of their children. And, and in some cases, it tells us how long they lived and so on. Now, this is not written in the style of a parable. Parable, you know, Jesus will take something that's an everyday familiar experience and relate it to something spiritual. And it, usually parables, they don't have specific names. Usually there was a certain man, something like that. And you certainly wouldn't have a detailed genealogy in a parable. That would be less than useless. That would distract from the main point rather than enhancing it. No, this isn't written as a parable, not at all. And people will say, but, but Dr. Lyle, the Bible has poetic sections like Psalms. I think Genesis is just poetry. It's not meant to be taken literally. And of course, I, I know the Bible does contain poetic literature like the Psalms and Proverbs. They're still true, but you have to interpret them according to the right hermeneutic. I understand that. But Genesis is not written in the style of Hebrew poetry. Not at all. I mean, this would make a terrible poem, wouldn't it? So-and-so begets so-and-so. That's terrible. And of course, it's even more obvious if you know something about the Hebrew language, the way that, that Hebrew is constructed. It uses parallelism. And uh, I don't know if you've covered that or not, but it's, it, it's very obvious that Genesis is not. Genesis is written in the style that the Hebrews recorded their history. It really is. It's historic narrative. Now, how do you read a history book? You pick up a history book that says George Washington rode his horse into battle. Do you pick out the symbolic meaning of everything? I wonder what it means by George Washington. What does that symbolize? And what does horse represent? <laughs> well, it's history, right? And history is to be read in a literal sense, with, with, you know, taking into account occasional figures of speech, but for the most part, it's primarily literal. And Genesis is history and therefore is to be read as literal history. And it's important, by the way, these genealogies are significant. You may think, well, that's, you know, those, we skim over those details, but they're important. And in fact, the Bible tells us that these genealogies lead up to Jesus. Jesus is descended from Adam. And, the, and of course, the Bible tells us we're all descended from Adam. Uh, Acts 17 makes that clear, that we're all of one blood. We're all descended from one man. And that's theologically important, by the way. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But here's my question then for Christians who compromise. Say, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. But I just think Adam is a, a metaphor. Well, Jesus is descended from Adam. You're saying Jesus descended from all those people, descended from a metaphor? That doesn't make any sense, does it? You don't have to know a lot about genetics to know a real person can't be descended from a metaphorical one. That doesn't work at all. No, it's, it's theologically important that Jesus is descended from a real Adam, and so are we all, because you know that makes Jesus our relative. You say, why is that important? Because according to biblical law, only a relative can save you. There's this important concept that's uh, recorded throughout the Old Testament, the concept of the kinsman redeemer. Uh, only a blood relative can atone for your sins on the cross. It's because, it's because we're all of one blood, as it were, that Jesus' blood on the cross can atone for our sins. He can represent us because he's our relative. We're all of one blood. Unless, of course, evolution's true. In which case, you might not be descended from Adam. You might be descended from some other ape-like ancestor. Maybe you're not related to Jesus. In which case, you can't be saved. See the problem? That's why the blood of, by the way, that's why the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins, the Bible, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 right? It's because we're not related to them. Their blood is not our blood. 
Now, they were used symbolically in the Old Testament to point forward to Messiah to come, but they can't actually pay for sins because we're not related to them. Unless, of course, evolution is true, in which case we are related to them. And that doctrine is gone. You see how even the gospel message itself goes back to a literal genesis? Where do we get the idea that, that uh, death is the penalty for sin? That goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? That's a Genesis concept. And so the idea of, of Jesus having to die on the cross in order to pay for the penalty for our sin, that's a Genesis concept. And it can't be accounted for apart from a literal Genesis. Putting it another way, which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Is it the first Adam who made it necessary for us to be saved, or Jesus Christ, whom the Bible calls the last Adam, who made it possible for us to be saved? You see, without the first Adam, it would make no sense to require a last Adam. And what, why would the Bible even call them? I mean, the, the, the last Adam, that's the Bible's term uh, for Jesus in, in certain passages. I think that's very interesting. The connection there is very strong. By the way, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, believing in literal creation is a requirement for salvation, but rather I'm saying it's a requirement for salvation to make sense. It, it's only if, if Genesis is really true, if there really is an Adam, that it would make sense for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. I understand that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. I want to add to that. But at the same time, the Bible makes it very clear that the reason that we need a Savior in Christ is because of what Adam did. There is a connection there. It's a very important one. You see, the good news, the gospel, gospel means good news. The good news is that Christ provides salvation for sin. But in order for that good news to make sense, you really have to understand the bad news. And the bad news is that man is lost and we need to be saved from our sin. We're sinners descended from sinners. We're born rebelling against God and we rebel from our own sin nature voluntarily. And uh, that's why we need a savior. And so I think when we're witnessing to people, we need to say, yes, I do have some good news to share with you, but first the bad news. Let me tell you why you need salvation. There's a novel concept. Take them back to the beginning rather than starting the, uh, the narrative in the middle. Why not take them back to the beginning? Explain how, why they need a savior, right? If you've ever started watching a movie in the middle of it, it can be very confusing because you don't understand the setup. You don't understand what's happening. Why, why is that person in that situation? I don't get it. We need to rewind, go back to the beginning and explain Christianity from its foundation. Then it's gonna make sense. If you don't do that, if you just say, hey, trust in Jesus, people will say, why? Why do I need a savior? I'm basically a good person. You hear people say that all the time. They assume God grades on the curve and they think, you know, I'm, hey, I'm above average. I haven't killed anybody after all, right? And you say, well, wait a minute. I haven't killed anybody either, but um, how many sins did Adam commit to ruin the world? One. He didn't kill anybody. He ate from a tree. <laughs> but you see, it was rebellion against God, and that's high treason. That's high treason. People who think, well, that's no big, it's no big deal to sin have a very low view of God. God is an infinite God. He is our King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. To rebel against him is high treason, and it deserves an infinite penalty, an infinite death, actually. And, of course, uh, God is merciful, and he's willing to take our place on the cross. But the fact is, we've all sinned, the Bible tells us, and therefore we all require a Savior. And, and what is the penalty for sin? How do you deal with this? Death's the penalty for sin. That's why Christ had to, to die on the cross to take our sins. You see, it goes back to Genesis. That's where we learn that death's the penalty for sin. It goes back to the beginning. That's where we learn that we're sinners descended from sinners born inheriting that sin nature from Adam. The Bible really is the history book of the universe. And I find that a lot of Christians, sort of, they sort of like the moral teachings of the Bible, but they want to reject the history. Maybe so they can accept evolution, what, what have you. But the moral teachings of the Bible come out of the history. The moral teachings only make sense because what the Bible says about history is true. And when Jesus was explaining this to uh, Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus, he came to Christ at nighttime, so it's not to be seen, presumably, Nick at night, right? And he came to Christ, and, uh, and how did Jesus respond to him when he, when he had trouble understanding? Because Jesus was making some very good analogies, and Nicodemus didn't quite get it. Jesus said, I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? That's a pretty good question. I mean, the Bible does talk about earthly things, like the days of creation, the, uh, the, the worldwide flood of Noah's time, the confusion of tongues at Babel. And the Bible also speaks of heavenly things, uh, moral issues, how to be saved. Now, if you say, yes, I know the Bible speaks about creation and God's days and a worldwide flood. I'm not sure I really believe those details, though. If God didn't get the details right in Genesis, how can you trust that he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? That's what I want to know. 
Does God know how to write a book or doesn't he? That's the issue, isn't it? A lot of people want to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm saved. I just don't believe the history the Bible teaches. But really, we can't be saved apart from the truth of the history the Bible teaches. The fact that Christ literally died and rose again. And that, that's, that's an historical fact. And without that, your faith is in vain. If Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. You're still in your sins. You can't be saved. And, and Christ's payment for our sins only makes sense if Genesis is literally true. If, the, if death really is the penalty for sin, and therefore that had to be the mechanism by which Jesus paid for our sins. But people want to have it both ways, don't they? They want to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I want to believe in evolution too, perhaps to be academically respected, because that's the cool position. Apparently, that's what most scientists believe. And uh, when you try to make those two things agree, guess which one gets modified? Yeah, well, I didn't really mean that God created like that. That's just symbolic for evolution. By the way, the one you modify is the one you don't really have your faith in. You can't modify your ultimate standard because you'd need a greater standard to tell you how to modify it. So if the Bible is your ultimate standard, you can't touch it. I found that tolerance for secular ideas is growing in the church, and so is intolerance for the Word of God. And that's a sad fact. Uh, the word tolerance has changed a little bit over the years, hasn't it? It used to mean you were just respectful of people that you disagreed with, and now it sort of means accepting um, any, any sort of nonsensical idea. And, and this is not the way that Jesus responded in his earthly ministry, right? He, when people came to him and, and, and they had mixed up ideas, and they distorted God's word, they weren't interpreting it properly, they, weren't, they were relying on man's word rather than God's word to construct their theology, how did Jesus respond to that? Did he say, well, that's not my personal opinion, but if you want to believe that, that's fine, you know, with that modern political correctness? He didn't respond that way, did he? Did he say, well, you know, it's not a salvation issue, so let's agree to disagree, and let's just all hold hands and sing kumbaya, right? <laughs> he didn't respond that way. Uh, he said, it is written, have you not read? Jesus did not respond with modern tolerance. Now, I believe he was as respectful as he should have been, but at the same time, he wasn't tolerant in the modern sense. And so when people tell me, well, Dr. Lau, you're intolerant, I usually say, well, thanks, but I can't take credit for it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ working in my life that makes me more intolerant to sin every day. And I think that's the attitude we need to have as Christians. It really is. We need to follow in Christ's footsteps and say, and take people back to the written word. It is written. Have you not read? God's word says this, and there's no compromising that. Christ stood on the authority of the word as an example for us. And we need to do that as well. You can think of the culture war today, and there is a culture war going on today. Wouldn't you agree with that? And the, the main war is between Christianity and secular humanism. Those are the two great faith systems in our culture today, in the United States in particular, but also around the world as well. And of course, you have Christianity based on creation, based on God's word determines truth. The Bible is our ultimate standard. And you have uh, secular humanism is based, it's really based on an evolutionary worldview. Man independent from God determines truth is their ultimate standard. And how are we fighting this war? Perhaps not as effectively as we could be. We're asleep at the helm, oblivious to the fact that a war is going on. We're shooting in the wrong direction entirely, shooting ourselves shooting our own foundation, representing Christians who say, it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis, boom. Just as long as you believe in Jesus, then you know, your theology can be way off and that's fine, boom. And of course, we're shooting some balloons and that's okay. Um, it's okay to point out that abortion's wrong and racism's wrong, they are, I, I understand that. But my point is if that's all we're doing, we're not really fighting the war very effectively because we're hitting these high level symptoms rather than dealing with the root of the problem. Christians have spent millions of dollars combating abortion, has it worked? We still have abortion, right? Because you see, those issues are gonna keep coming back if we don't deal with the actual problem rather than just focusing on alleviating symptoms. Of course, the secular humanists are smart. They're aiming at our foundation. They're saying, well, you can't trust the Bible because you can't trust the very beginning verse. Well, what's the solution to this? I think it's fine to, to pop some balloons every now and then. That's great, we should fight those things. But at the same time, we need to do more than that. We need to defend ourselves against these evolutionary arguments, point out how they're uh, really pseudoscience. They're not, they're not good scientific arguments against creation. You can't have that. In fact, apart from creation, you can't really have science. I actually have another presentation I do on that topic. Uh, but science is predicated on the fact that God upholds the universe in a consistent way that the human mind is able to s systematically discover. If the universe is just chance, it would make no sense to, find, to expect to find patterns in it. 
and to be able, and that the human mind, or just a collection of mutations, would be able to discover patterns, even if should there be any. Science is predicated on the Christian worldview. In any case, we need to point out those problems, point out that evolution itself is a scientifically bankrupt conjecture. It, it doesn't have scientific support, not when you understand it. And of course, most of our resources are to that end. I'm talking more theology this morning, but, but we do a lot of stuff at ICR that shows how the science confirms what the Bible teaches. And that's, that, that's over in this category. I want to show people that creation really is true. The science lines up with it. The science is secondary. God's word is our ultimate standard, but nonetheless, God has given us wonderful confirmations that he really did create in the way he says he did in Genesis. And we love to encourage Christians with that, with that scientific evidence. And we like to challenge evolutionists with it. And, uh, we're, and of course, you notice we're not aiming at people either. We, we, you know, our battle's not against the people. It's against this castle, which represents an idea that is not God honoring. We want to cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. We're praying that people will jump off and swim over here and join us on the castle of Christianity. We want people to be saved. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's the bottom line. And it's, it, it breaks my heart that a lot of Christians want to leave the Bible out of the discussion and, hey, I'll, just, I'll show you that God exists. Well, hey, the demons believe in God and tremble. It doesn't save them. A creationist will end up in hell, the same as an evolutionist, if they haven't trusted in Christ for the salvation of their sins. And so uh, I, I don't think we should divorce the scientific evidence from what the Bible teaches. We need to, we, I'm, by all means, use some scientific evidence. But at the same time, the Bible needs to be our ultimate standard because we want people to be saved. And salvation isn't possible apart from them trusting in Christ as their Savior, as revealed in the Scriptures. What about the time scale of creation? That's, there's some controversy there. There really shouldn't be. But uh, in any case, the Bible teaches that God created in six days. It tells us what he did on each of those days of creation. Human beings are made on the sixth day. And from uh, those other passages that we've read, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, you can add up the ages of these patriarchs and and you can get the time scale between Adam and Christ is something, Christ's earthly ministry is something like 4,000 years, and we all agree that was 2,000 years ago. So something like 6,000 years for the age of the universe, not just the earth, but the universe. That bothers people because, of course, in the secular schools, we're taught millions of years, right? The fossils allegedly were deposited over hundreds of millions of years. You'll find that in the textbooks. There it is, millions of years, right? Got to be true. It's in the textbooks. But, uh, well, and it's not that... The scientists, the secular scientists, are intentionally being deceptive in some cases, but um, they've been trained to think that way. But the fact is, it, you would never conclude millions of years just from Scripture. That's my point. You'd never conclude that from Scripture. But people get intimidated, don't they? They think, well, you know, scientists are very smart, and they think the world's millions of years old. Maybe, I gotta, maybe I'm not reading the Bible correctly. It's fine to go back and double check, but when the Bible's clear on something, we need to stand on God's Word, even if it goes against what the brilliant people of the, of the secular world say. But people get, Christians get intimidated and they think, we've got to get the millions of years in there somewhere. Well, where are you going to add the millions of years into the biblical time scale? You can't add it between Adam and Christ because that would destroy those genealogies, right? You can't say in so-and-so we get so-and-so, and then a million years later they get so-and-so. That's not going to work. But there's only six days, right, before man was, man was created on the sixth day. So people try to put the millions of years into the creation week somehow because that's the only place they can think to do it. And so they'll say, well, maybe the, begin maybe the millions of years happens before the beginning. But that's pretty easy to refute because if it happened before the beginning, then the beginning wouldn't be the beginning, would it? <laughs> that doesn't work. Or maybe there's a gap in between verse 1 and verse 2. I'll come back to that when the gap theory um, there's no evidence for that in the scriptures. One of the most common, though, today is that the days really weren't days, but they were long ages, perhaps hundreds of millions of years each, the so-called day-age theory. And uh, a lot of times theistic evolutionists and progressive creationists will jump on that and they'll say, yeah, God created for sure, but he created over millions of millions of years in six ages. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of problems with that. By the way, the order is different. If you, if, if you think you can get the secular time scale to line up with the biblical time scale by making the days long, you're sadly mistaken because the order is different. According to uh, the secular view, stars existed long before the earth. But according to the Bible, stars are made on day four after the earth. The, the order is very different. So just stretching the days out doesn't help you to line up, line up the two different scales. And there's no support scripturally for taking these days to be anything but days. Now people will claim there is. They'll say, oh, but Dr. Lyle, we know that in 2 Peter 3.8, the Bible says one day is what the Lord is a thousand years, right? 
I've heard a lot of people say that. I've been hearing people say that for what seems like millions of years. But, um, <laughs> but no, first of all, this verse isn't referring to Genesis anyway in terms of the days of creation. It's horribly out of context to try and make the days of creation long using this verse. It's not what it's referring to. And I think it's interesting too, people only pull the first part of the verse out of context. I tell them, read the rest of the verse. What does it say? One day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It cancels that right out, you see? It goes the other direction. People only take the first part out of context to try and make time longer. They never take the second part out of context to make time shorter, right? And of course, this isn't saying that, you know, a day is a thousand years. It's saying it's like that or as that to God. It's a simile. It's comparing two things using like or as. And it's because, in fact, it's because a day is so different from a thousand years that the simile is powerful. This is really telling us God is beyond time. If a day really were a thousand years, you could substitute it in. And the passage would say, with God, a thousand years is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a thousand years. Which I suppose would be true, but it would be trivial, wouldn't it? It, would, it, it, would be, it wouldn't be worth saying. The power of the passage is because a day is so different from a thousand years. It's telling us God is beyond time. And since God is beyond time, whenever God uses time language, it is always for our benefit and therefore to be understood in human terms. Always. God does know how to communicate. This whole idea that it, one, of the, one of the more popular views that of, the, of the compromisers who say, well, maybe it's you know, the days or millions of years. One of the more popular views is that words mean something different to God, right? Maybe God's days aren't the same as our days. But follow that logic. When he says he makes trees, what does he really mean? Maybe God's trees aren't the same as our trees, right? And when, you know, I mean, if you're going to follow that logic to, to consistency, then there's no reason to believe anything in the Bible. When God says, thou shalt not kill, it really might mean eat more broccoli. If, I mean, if words mean different things to God, communication would be impossible. Communication can only occur when the sender and the recipient agree on the meaning of words. God does know how to communicate. He, in fact, he created Adam with language. Isn't that interesting? We have to learn language as we're born and we grow and so on. He, he programmed, he pre-programmed Adam with language the same way computers are programmed with a language built already into them. Anyway, this passage is not giving you permission to change the word day to a thousand years everywhere you see it in scripture. That wouldn't give you a old earth anyway, right? Because it'd make the earth 12,000 years old instead of 6,000 if each of the days was a thousand years each. It doesn't get you anywhere close to the millions of years that people think they need to add to the scriptures. The Hebrew word for day is yom, and it's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament of the Bible in singular and plural form. The plural form is yom mem. And I, I find the only place people question, what does day mean, is in Genesis. Isn't that true? Do you have... Bible studies sitting around asking what day means in other portions of the scripture. Jonah in the belly of the great fish, was he there for three ordinary days or were those thousands of years? Who knows? He might have been in there a long time, right? I mean, people don't argue that, do they? It's, it's pretty clear. Or how long did Joshua really take to march around the walls of Jericho? Were those ordinary days or thousands of years? Who can say? We can't tell, right? <laughs> See, the absurdity becomes clear when you apply this to other passages. People say, oh, but Dr. Lau, the Hebrew word for day can mean a period of time longer than 24 hours. It doesn't have to mean 24 hours in all instances. And that's true in certain contexts, like in the day of the Lord, when it's combined with a prepositional phrase, primarily in the poetic sections of the Bible. But the main meaning for Yom, well over 90, 95% of the time, is day. That's, that's the primary meaning of it. Even our English word for day can mean a period of time longer than 24 hours. You might say, back in my father's day, that would be a period of time longer than 24 hours. It wouldn't be millions of years, but it would be longer than 24 hours. It's a period of time. I get that. But you see, context makes it clear, doesn't it? And so, for example, if I read this sentence back, in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback during the day. You've got the word day used three times, and I'll bet you didn't have any trouble understanding it because you used context. You used the surrounding words to constrain the meaning. And so it's very clear Back in my father's day, yeah, that would be a period of time longer than 24 hours. 10 days, well, that's got a number with it, 10 days. It wouldn't be 10 periods of time. That's obviously 10 uh, earth rotations, right? And you got the Australian outback during the day. That would be the light portion of an ordinary day. It's very clear. It's the same way with Hebrew or any language. Context determines the meaning of a word when a word has more than one meaning, which most words do, actually. And so let's take a look at the Hebrew word day outside of Genesis 1, where we all agree what it means. No problem understanding Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three ordinary days. We get that. We find, for example, outside of Genesis 1, that when day is used with a number, like the third day, the fourth day, 
It always means an ordinary day. It's very clear outside of Genesis 1. We all agree, of course, if I said the third day, the fourth day, you know I'm talking about ordinary days. If there was evening and morning, the words evening and morning together, even if the word day isn't there, what's an evening plus a morning? It's a day, right? Part of a day, another part of a day, you get a day. And so that happens 38 times each, or 38 times where there's two or together outside of Genesis 1. We all agree it's an ordinary day. If I said there was evening that day, that would constitute an ordinary day. If I said there was morning that day, you'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day. And that happens 23 times each outside of Genesis 1. We all agree it's an ordinary day. If I said there was day, then there was night. So day contrasted with night. Then you'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day. Very, very clear. In all of the horse historical narrative literature of the Bible, it's very clear. So let's apply these contextual clues to Genesis 1 and see if we can figure out what God meant when he said day. So Genesis 1 verse 5, and God called the light day. So there he's defining day for you. Day is when it's light out. That would be an ordinary day. And the darkness he called night. So he's got day contrasted with night. Got to be an ordinary day. And the evening, you got evening associated with day. Got to be an ordinary day. You got morning associated with day. Got to be an ordinary day. You got evening and morning together, which constitutes an ordinary day. And you got a number with it. First, how about that? Pretty clear the first day is an ordinary day. God used not just one, but basically all of the contextual indicators he could have used. Very clear. What about the other days of creation, though? Are those, are those ordinary days? Evening, morning, number, day. 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 I think it's pretty clear, don't you? It's almost like God's trying to say, see, they're ordinary days, and in case you're still not convinced, they're ordinary days. And in case you're a little thick, they're ordinary days. In case you're really intellectually challenged, they're ordinary days. <laughs> it's pretty clear, isn't it? Wow. That's pretty obvious. Yeah, it's funny, because how else could he have said it? I mean, people say, well, he could have said it's 24 hours. No, because then the critics would say, but what's an hour, right? I mean, really, he used just about every indication he could that those are ordinary days. People say, oh, but the sun wasn't made until the fourth day. It doesn't matter, because you see, it's, it's primarily the rotation of the earth that sets the length of the day. The sun just provides a relatively permanent, stable light source. As long as you have a rotating planet and you have a light source, you're going to have day and night. Do we have a light source on the first day? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Yeah, we had a light source. Do we have a rotating planet? There's evening and morning. We had a rotating planet. So yeah, you're going to have day and night for the first three days. And then God replaces that temporary light source with the sun on the fourth day, maybe to displace it so it wouldn't be as easy to be inclined to worship it as if it were some sort of deity. God is the source of life, not the sun, ultimately. Um, so you got the kids saying, six days? Yep. Six truly, really days? Yep. You sure it says six days? Yes. I wonder why he took so long. That's the question we ought to be asking. I mean, God had the power to create the universe in an instant. He's God. He didn't need any time at all to create the universe. He really had to slow himself down to make in six days. And then he rested for a day. Why did he do that? Was he tired? Not at all. God doesn't get tired. Not at all. But we do. And God knew that. He did that as a pattern for us. And the Bible's very clear about that. The work week, God created in six days and rested one as a pattern for us. That's where we get our idea for a week. Did you know all the other units of time have a basis in astronomy? A day is a rotation of Earth on its axis. A month is the amount of time it takes the moon to go through its phases. That's where we get the word month. It's a month, right? That's it's, it's how it goes through its phases there. The year is the amount of time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. Where do we get the idea of seven days in a week? That's how long it took for God to create and rest. There's no astronomical basis for it. And so the fact that virtually all cultures on Earth just about have a seven-day week indicates they all knew about creation at some point. Kind of interesting, isn't it? It's evidence for biblical creation. And uh, yeah, very interesting. This is, this is the explanation for it. Verse 8, where God says, this is, of course, part of the Ten Commandments. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He explains, in six days you'll do all your labor. The seventh is the Lord. Verse 11 is the explanation. You're to do it that way because that's what God did. You're to follow his example. God did it that way for our benefit. Back in Martin Luther's time, there were some people who were trying to say that uh, God really created in an instant, or at least in one day. And uh, kind of the uh, opposite, same problem we have today, but in the opposite direction. They were not taking God's word at face value. And I love how Martin Luther responds to this distortion. He says, how long did the work of creation take? When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. 
I love this last part. He says, but if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> That's a great quote. We need to have a little bit of humility. We need to have a lot of humility before our Creator and trust that He does know how to do what He says He did. There's the gap theory for folks who say, yes, there's no doubt the days are ordinary days. Can't get around that, but maybe we can shove millions of years in between two of them. In particular, in between verse 1 and verse 2, they'd like to say, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and they say, and, and, and God created a, a, a civilization of maybe of people before Adam, or maybe that's, maybe the, the angels were given the earth at that point, and, and all this stuff happened, and then, you know, millions of years later is verse 2. They'd like to translate verse 2, and the earth became without form and void. It really can't be translated that way, though, based on the... Um, the structure of the Hebrew there. But in any case, that's what they would say. And they say, and we got other scriptures to support this too, that the world was once full of people and then it got ruined and then um, Adam is God recreating the world. Because doesn't, doesn't the King James Bible, doesn't God tell Adam and Eve to go and replenish the earth? Doesn't that mean to refill? Well, no. Actually, the Hebrew word that's translated replenish in the King James Bible just means to fill thoroughly, completely. It doesn't mean to fill again. And it's not an error in the King James. It's just when the King James was translated in 1611, the word replenish meant to fill completely. Words change their meaning a little bit with time. Today we think of replenish to refill. But it really just means to fill completely. So you can't use that to support this idea that the earth once had a previous civilization. Uh, not at all. And in fact, uh, the gap theory won't work on the basis of the Hebrew language. This is Genesis um, chapter 1 in, in Hebrew. Hebrew reads right to left. And so you have verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form. That, that verse 2 uses a Hebrew construction called a vav disjunctive. Vav is the Hebrew letter for and. When you have and and the earth, uh, whenever you start a, a sentence that way, it indicates that that verse is a comment on what came before it. It's kind of like what we'd use parentheses for in English. So, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, parentheses, and the earth was without form and void. It's explaining the conditions that existed in verse 1. It's an explanation of it. And so my point is, you can't put a gap of time in between verse 1 and 2, because verse 2 does not follow in time. Verse 2 is an explanation of verse 1. And so the gap theory has been very thoroughly refuted on the basis of Hebrew grammar. Now, the rest of Genesis is not vav disjunctive. It's vav consecutive. It does follow in time. That's where you have and and a verb, and said God. In English, we say, and God said, but in Hebrew, it's, it's and followed by a verb, and that does follow in time. But even there, there's, there's no indication of gaps in between because Exodus 20.11 tells us in six days. That indicates in the span of six days, God created the heaven and the earth to see and all that's in them. What about science? You know, there's a lot of scientific evidence that confirms that God created thousands of years ago, not millions or billions. We just don't hear about it very much. A lot of people have the impression that carbon dating gives millions of years, but you, you know it doesn't. Now there are other methods like uranium, lead, potassium, argon, these radiometric dating methods that scientists use, and of course there, there's a lot of guesswork that goes in them, there's lots of assumptions that are made, and they say we, th we think that you know, based on our measurements of these radioactive elements, we think this rock is billions of years old. The interesting thing is when you apply those methods to rocks that we know are recent, like a rock that just came out of a volcano and just hardened, which is supposed to set the zero point, they also give hundreds of thousands of millions of years. Okay, so the, the radiometric dating has been shown to not work on rocks of known age, and it's assumed to work on rocks of unknown age. Okay, that's really what it comes down to. But a lot of people, for some reason, think that carbon dating is one of those methods that gives millions of years. It doesn't. Carbon dating, first of all, it tends to give the right answer when we check it on things of known age. So I have a little bit more confidence in carbon dating. But carbon dating is our friend. Carbon dating is based on the C14, which is an unstable variety of carbon. Most carbon is C12. C14 has two extra neutrons, and it's unstable, which means it'll decay into nitrogen. Most carbon's stable, which is good, because you're made of a lot of carbon, and we don't want you decaying anytime soon. So, but you, all, you have a little bit of C14 in you, which is an unstable form of carbon, so you're all just a little bit unstable, but uh, you knew that. <laughs> but the fact is, we, C14 doesn't last millions of years. C14 can't even last one million years. And yet we find C14 in diamonds. Diamonds that evolutionists believe to be one to two billion years old. But you see, they can't even be one million years old. Or the C14 would be gone. They say, well, somehow new C14 got in there. How? It's a diamond. It's the hardest substance. How are you going to get new C14 in there? It doesn't even make sense. Obviously, it acquired that when it, when it formed. Uh, fossils, you can take fossils and carbon date them. You'll never get millions of years carbon dating them. Never. Dinosaur fossils, what have you. 
you'll get thousands of years. We know we've done it. We've taken dinosaur, in fact, we actually sent some dinosaur fossils into a secular lab. We didn't tell them they were dinosaur fossils because we wanted to get an objective, unbiased result. And they came back thousands of years. Isn't that interesting? They're not millions of years old. How about that? Lots of stuff like that. I have another presentation I do on that, but uh, the bottom line is, this is what I want you to take away this morning. The secular scientists say the Earth's billions of years old, take my word for it. God says I created six days, take my word for it. God's word or man's word? That's the issue. Now, yeah, I think the science backs up God's word. I think it confirms it. But ultimately, I trust that God created the way he says he created. That's the best reason to take it that way. Does it matter? Historically, the secular scientists came in and said, the Bible can't be true. These rock layers show the world is much, much older than what the Bible teaches. A lot of the theologians compromised. Not all of them. A lot of them compromised and said, well, you know, six days, it's not a salvation issue, so maybe we can allow for the millions of years. And a lot of Christians are tempted to do that today. Does it matter? Well, it's not a salvation issue in the sense that you don't have to believe in six days to be saved. You have to trust in Jesus to be saved. But of course, I could make an argument that Jesus believed in six days. He did, after all, inspire Genesis. So that's something to keep in mind. But uh, nonetheless, just because we're saved by God's grace doesn't mean that we should live in sloppy theology. We ought to study God's word and, 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 and improve our understanding of God in gratitude for salvation that he's already given us. Not an attempt to earn it. You can't earn salvation. But we ought to show gratitude to God and uh, get our theology right. So I would argue that it is an important issue, even though it's not something that's essential for salvation. Kind of like gravity. Gravity is not a salvation issue, right? You cannot believe in gravity and still go to heaven. You'll probably get there a lot quicker that way. It's, it's not a salvation issue. It is an important issue. And so it is with the days of creation. It's important for two reasons. Maybe a lot more than that, but two I'm going to mention. First of all, it's important because it's what God's Word teaches. And we're not to say, well, yeah, I know God's Word teaches this, but that's unimportant. No, if God's Word teaches something, it's important. God wouldn't have put it in there if it weren't important. Well, it doesn't matter just as long as you believe that God created. Well, if that's all that mattered, God wouldn't have written anything beyond Genesis 1.1. He gives us those details and he expects us to take those seriously. In fact, the section of God's word that says, in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, Exodus 20.11, that's part of the Ten Commandments. That's written, that was written by the finger of God in stone. You better take that seriously. We need to take all the Bible seriously. It's all inspired by God. I just find it interesting. The one place people really want to compromise is the one place God didn't even use a human agent. He wrote it directly himself in stone. That's where you want to compromise? That's not wise. <laughs> not at all. The same Bible that teaches that God created in six days also teaches the virgin birth of Christ, that Jesus turned the water into wine, walked on water, calmed the storm, raised the dead, raised himself from the dead. Same Bible teaches both, right? You say, yes, but I don't think I believe in the six days because most scientists say that's impossible. I'm going to reinterpret those sections. Well, I got news for you. Most scientists say a virgin birth is impossible and human beings. Most scientists say walking on water is impossible. Resurrection from the dead, that's not been documented scientifically. You'd have to reject those portions, too, to be logically consistent. Maybe reinterpret the resurrection as a spiritual sort of resurrection. No, no. You can't, can't do that. People say, oh, no, I don't want to do that. But my point is it's the same hermeneutic. Are you going to allow people who reject God's word to tell you how you ought to interpret God's word? Now, some people would say, oh, but Dr. Lyle, no, I, I believe in these because those are miracles. And so they don't have to be, you know, we don't, it, they don't have to be accountable to laws of science and so on. But... Wasn't creation in six days a miracle? Let's see you do it, right? You try it. Let there be light. Nothing happens. <laughs> Another reason, though, why you don't want to compromise with the millions of years is these fossils that we find all over the earth. And we do find fossils all over the earth. We find fossils, and most of them are marine fossils. Probably 95% of fossils are marine organisms. People think, well, dinosaurs, they're rare. Human fossils, very rare. 95% of fossils, marine invertebrates. Occasionally fish, things like that. Marine fossils everywhere, all over the, on the continents, on Mount Everest. It's almost as if the entire world were underwater at some point. How about that? I seem to remember reading that somewhere. <laughs> See, I think these fossils were deposited primarily in the worldwide flood, some afterwards, but most of them during that worldwide flood. But my secular colleagues, don't believe in a worldwide flood. Why? Because that would get rid of any evidence of millions of years. 
if one flood deposited all those fossils, there's, there's no evidence of millions of years, right? They have to believe that those fossils were deposited gradually over very long periods of time. And if you say, yeah, that's, I think the secularists are right. I think that maybe God created over millions of years and those fossils are hundreds of millions of years old. I think they're right about that. You've got a huge theological problem because a fossil is a dead thing. And if you believe that, that you've got dead things hundreds of millions of years ago, you realize you've got death before Adam sinned. In fact, you've got death before Adam existed because we all agree human beings don't go back hundreds of millions of years. Even the evolutionists won't concede that. They'll say maybe a million years, something like that. But human beings don't go back that, that long. And so if you've got death before Adam was even on the scene, then how can Adam's sin be responsible for bringing death into the world? That's what I want to know. Doesn't the Bible teach us that by man came death? Isn't that pretty clear? Not only in Genesis, but in the New Testament as well. It's, it's made very, very clear. But you see, if you believe in millions of years, you can't have it that way because it's by death came man. Even if you don't believe in evolution, if you just believe in the evolutionary time scale of millions of years, and that fossils are millions of years old, you got death preceding man's existence. So how can death be the penalty for sin if it's not something that, that uh, was instituted as a result of Adam's sin? You got Eve here saying, oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world. Adam's saying, yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said. But you see, if the fossils were already there, if animals had been dying and living for hundreds of millions of years, and then God finally got around to making Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, then you got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of millions of years worth of pain, death, killing, disease, struggling, extinction. That's what we find in the fossils. We find evidence of those things. There's a whole field called paleopathology that studies disease in fossils. We find evidence of arthritis, cancer, all kinds of diseases in these fossils that are allegedly hundreds of millions of years old. Now, if that, all that stuff was there before God created Adam and Eve, and he finally got around to creating Adam and Eve, and he looked at everything he'd made and said, behold, it's very good. Really? If those fossils are millions of years old, then you have to believe that when God called the world very good, it already had death, suffering, disease, bloodshed, already built into it. In which case, God's definition of very good really isn't very good, is it? Not at all. Now, I know some people will say, oh, but Dr. Lau, it's just human death that was introduced at the time of the fall. But you know what? I don't think you can defend that scripturally. In fact, when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing God did was he killed an animal to provide skins of clothing for them, right? That's what it would be animal skins. God instituted animal death as a temporary covering for Adam and Eve, symbolic, I think, of the uh, Messiah to come, who would actually deal with the problem of sin. Now, some people have said, oh, but I got you here, Dr. Lyle, because we know they were eating plants before sin, so at least plants had to die, right? But I, I got news for you. Plants, biblically, are not classified as alive. Yeah, there's, they're a different sort of thing. In fact, the Bible in the Hebrew uses a word nefesh, nefesh kai or nefesh kaya, which uh, means living creature. Plants are never referred to as nefesh kaya anywhere in Scripture uh, because they're not alive in the, in the biblical sense of the word. And we, we sort of know that, right? I mean, I mean, you can talk about a dead plant. You can talk about a dead battery, but that doesn't mean it was ever really alive in the same way that an animal is alive, right? This term, nefesh kaya, is only applied to human beings and animals, never to plants. Plants are different. Now, a modern biologist might classify plants using a different system where they're classified as alive. That's fine. But my point is, under the biblical system, they're not classified as alive. Plants are classified as food for things that are alive. And you sort of know that. You know plants are in a different category, right? You can talk about a dead plant. You can come across a so-called dead tree in the woods. You say, that's nice. I think I'll sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it, put it over my mantle. That works. But if you come across a dead animal, do you say, that's nice. I think I'll sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it, put it over my mantle. <laughs> you don't do that? No. That's different, isn't it? Because you see, when we see a dead animal, we know oh, that that's something, there's something disturbing about that, rightly, because we know that's an intrusion into a world that was once perfect. I mean, I could imagine that in the eternal state. I think there will continue to be a plant cycle in the eternal state as there was originally before sin, but you're not going to have animal death or certainly human death in the eternal state as there was, there was none originally. That's a result of the curse. That's a result of sin. No, the Bible makes it clear the world was a paradise when God first created it. He called it very good. God has high standards. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. When he calls the world very good, you can bet it was very, very good, exceedingly good in the Hebrew. But because of sin, we now live in a world that's broken. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of beauty in the world today, but there's some ugliness too as a result of sin. The world is a broken world today. But thanks to what Christ did on the cross, the world will be restored, and the world will once again 
be uh, a paradise as it was originally. I want to skip some of these for time's sake. I'm just pointing out you can't deal with the problem of tragedy. Um, if you blame God for the fossils, if you say, yeah, God created over billions of years of death and suffering, then when your friend dies, you can blame God for it. It's his fault. But the Bible makes it clear it's our fault that's, that death entered the world. God, instituted, God did institute death, but he did it as the right punishment for Adam's sin. It's our fault when somebody dies. And <laughs> it's only by God's grace that we don't die instantly the moment we sin. So six days versus millions of years is really the same issue as creation versus evolution. Are you going to trust what God has clearly written in his word, or are you going to trust man's understanding of the evidence? And there's a lot of other things you can't explain as well, like thorns. Did you know we find thorns deep down in layers that evolutionists believe to be 400 million years old? Now, if, the, if that's true, if they're really 400 million years old, then when Adam cursed the world and told Adam, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, Adam could have said, so what? Thorns have been around for millions of years. What are you talking about, God? You see, it wouldn't make any sense, would it? Thorns came after sin. The Bible tells us that. So they can't be millions of years old. That's just one example of these, these things. People think they can just pull away the days of creation and the rest of the scriptures will be unaffected. But the Bible all hangs together or it all falls apart. What about the extent of the flood? Did you know you can't, you can't consistently believe in a worldwide flood and millions of years because either the fossils were deposited gradually over hundreds of millions of years or a worldwide flood would do that. You can't have both because a worldwide flood would destroy any previous fossil record anyway. And so there are folks who teach that um, the flood was just a local event limited to the Mesopotamia Valley because they, have to believe, they want to believe in millions of years. But what does the Bible say about the extent of the flood? Was it a local flood limited to the Mesopotamia Valley or a global flood? Let's take a look. Genesis 6.17, God says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy, what, a few things here and there? To destroy all flesh. Wherein is the breath of life from, what, the local Mesopotamia Valley? No, from under heaven. That means under the sky. That would be kind of global, wouldn't it? And everything that is in the earth shall die. Now, to me, that sounds an awful lot like a global flood. But just to add insult to injury, let's read on. Genesis 7, 19 through 20. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Not just the high hills, all the high hills. And not just in the local area, but under the heaven. And not just under the heaven, but under the whole heaven. God, I mean, God, how many superlatives does God have to use before we get the point that he means a global flood? Verse 20, 15 cubits upward did the, wa did the waters prevail. The mountains were covered by a local flood? Doesn't happen, does it? All flesh died that moved upon the earth. Every creeping thing, every man, all in whose nostrils was of the breath of life, but all that was in the dry land died. Every living substance was destroyed, and Noah only remained alive, and they were with him on the ark. Sounds like a global flood, doesn't it? By the way, you can't have a local flood that covers the high hills. Think about that. What would it look like, a local flood that covers the high hills? It would look like that. It doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> it doesn't, see, sometimes when you just picture these things, it, the, the absurdity becomes clear. For that matter, what was the purpose of the rainbow? God's promise never to send another global flood. But if it was just a local flood, then God has broke his promise thousands of times. A few months ago, we had devastating, catastrophic flooding in, in Dallas. I know you guys would probably like some of that, but uh, it was amazing. But it wasn't global. <laughs> God doesn't break his promise. The rainbow tells us God's never going to send another global flood. What about the ark? Why would you spend all, that, all those resources building an ark the size of an ocean liner, taking two of every air-breathing land animal on board on earth for a local flood that you knew was coming? Why not just move? Right? <laughs> I think that would be a lot easier. Um, well, yeah, I'm going to skip some of these for time's sake. A lot of these are funny, but it's interesting. You know, the Bible predicts that in the last days, people would deny that worldwide flood. It says uh, in verse 5, For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. It tells us that people, scoffers, would deny a worldwide flood. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. The Bible's spot on about that. Spot on. And... Uh, not surprising for those of us who understand the Christian worldview. I want to close out with this cross series. We're almost done here. And uh, this, I think, really sums up the situation very well. The church is preaching a message. Come to Jesus. Come to the cross and be saved. That's the right message. We want to be preaching that, of course. But there's been an attack in the form of millions of years. That's one of the attacks on the Christian worldview. But you see, when that impacts, we're inclined to think, 
Oh, didn't hit the cross. Millions of years, not a salvation issue. Don't have to worry about it. What we fail to realize is that millions of years is an attack on Genesis. If millions of years is true, Genesis isn't. It's that simple. Genesis tells us in six days. And the gospel message is based in Genesis. That's where we get the idea of death being the penalty for sin. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. If, millions of year, if fossils are millions of years old, that's gone. Death isn't the penalty for sin if fossils are hundreds of millions of years old. Satan's crafty. If he were aiming at the cross, we'd be concerned about that. Right? If, he's, if somebody comes and you say, well, Jesus didn't even exist. Well, you can get books to defend that. To defend the, the existence of Jesus, his death and resurrection. We recognize that as an important issue. But then Satan aims at our foundation, and we think it's just a side issue. It's not. It's a foundational issue. It's important. And then historically, all these different attacks came. Age dating methods, evolution, eight men, millions of years, no global flood. And they impact right solid on Genesis, we think. Didn't hit the cross, really it was a direct hit. And what is the result of all these different attacks on the foundational book of the Word of God, the first book of the Word of God? Unbelief. Because the fact is, if Genesis can't be trusted, then when does God start telling the truth? And, and why would you trust the gospel message that stems from Genesis? And so we have unbelief as a result of this. If I've told you of earthly things and you don't believe, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Pretty logical question. These symptoms happen. Newsflash, prayer out loud in schools. We say, hey, trust in Jesus. Don't get me wrong, we should trust in Jesus. But my point is we're not dealing with the problem. Creation's outlawed in schools. We say, hey, Jesus is going to return. Yes, he is. But until then, he's told us to be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks a reason of the hope that's in us and, do us, and to do so with uh, gentleness and respect. The Bible's outlawed in schools. We think, let's get the Bible back into schools. And, you know, I'm all for uh, make it, trying to affect a, uh, a political environment that's favorable to Christianity. But my point is, that's not really dealing with the root of the problem. Ten Commandments outlawed in schools. Hey, let's concentrate on worship. The church can do lots and lots of good things, but if we don't do what God's commanded us to do and being ready to give an answer, then the gospel will continue to be obscured by unbelief. Because you see, we live in a culture now where the Bible is ridiculed, and it's ridiculed starting in Genesis. That's the place where they say you can't trust it because of all this science, allegedly, that proves millions of years of evolution. We need to be ready to answer that. That's why organizations like ICR exist. We come alongside the church. We're not a church as an organization. Of course, all of us at ICR are members of our own local church body. But as an organization, we want to come alongside the church, repair the damage that's been done, show you you can trust in Genesis. It really is true. And frankly, when you understand the science, the science lines run up with what you'd expect from Genesis. That's, in fact, that's really a lot of what we do is on that is on the science end. I didn't talk about that a lot this morning, but a lot of what we do is showing how science confirms creation and really is inconsistent with what you'd expect in an evolutionary worldview. And then we want to warn you when these different attacks come, these are attacks on the Christian faith. They're not just side issues, they're foundational. And then we show you how to destroy those different attacks with all the different uh, resources that we produce. That's why we produce them. And ultimately, we'd like to be in the background. We'd like everyone in the church to be able to defend the faith against all these different uh, arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. We need to be able to cast those down. And then the church can say, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And then it'll be effective because people will understand, yes, the Bible really is the word of God. And yes, what it says in Genesis can be trusted. And therefore, death really is the penalty for sin. Those fossils that, that evolutionists believe to be hundreds of millions of years old, actually, that's evidence of judgment of God. It's evidence that God judges sin and I need to be saved. And that points, you see, to the, to the Messiah, to Christ. God is a just God and will judge sin, but he's also merciful and he provides a way of escape. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I'm sure he was out there preaching, come on board the ark and be saved. And of the perhaps billions of people that were on the earth at the time, and there could have been as many as today. Actually, you do the math. It, um, it, I mean, we don't know exactly, but of all those people, only his immediate family really was saved. His uh, wife and his sons and their wives, eight people. Wow. And then I think it's interesting, too, the Bible says that God was the one that closed the door on the ark. God is the one who decides time of mercy over, time of judgment begin. There's always that window. And we don't know what it, what it is for each person we, because we don't know when you're going to die. But we do know that it's appointed once for men to die, and after this comes judgment. And so uh, we need to really get out there with this message that God's word is trustworthy from the beginning so that we can then teach people about the gospel message, the, the God who can save them from their sins. 
We have a number of great resources that I would encourage you to get. We have these out back that will equip you to defend the Christian faith in this area. Uh, one I'd highly recommend, Creation Basics and Beyond. This is written by all of our staff scientists. It's going to give you uh, answers to all kinds of questions that perhaps you have about creation or that people will likely ask you and you need to be able to answer, like, was there an ice age? And what about continental drift or plate tectonics? And where did the water from the flood come from? And where did it go? And how did Noah get all those animals on the ark anyway? And were there ape men? And what about distant starlight? All of those are answered in that book. And by the way, if you say that, I don't know, that looks awfully thick and intimidating. <laughs> we have a thinner version as well. We have one called Guide to Creation Basics that we've designed for students, but frankly, adults will like it too. It's a great resource. In fact, we have a three pack that's got create, Guide to Creation Basics and one on dinosaurs. Boy, that's an issue that comes up a lot. How do we make sense of those in the Christian worldview? Well, we had two dinosaur experts write a, a wonderful book on that, Guide to Dinosaurs, and there's another one, Guide to Fossils, and it's a, th a wonderful three-pack that I encourage you to get. I don't have a slide for it, but you'll see that out uh, front as, as well. Uh, we have uh, Understanding Genesis. We sold out of this, but you can back order it. This, is, this goes through and shows you how you, can, how you can know that Genesis really does mean that God created in six days. So um, again, we can back order that for you. The ultimate proof of creation. If you say, I want a really powerful bulletproof argument that no one can answer that demonstrates that creation must be true, this is it. This is gonna show you how to debate and how to think the way that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. It's gonna show you biblical principles on how to debate. It's gonna show you that unless creation is true, you couldn't have science. You couldn't have technology. It's only because of the way that God has constructed the universe that these things are possible. It's a powerful argument. I've been using this for years. Nobody's been able to come back from it. That doesn't mean they'll necessarily be persuaded, necessarily, but I can tell you this, they won't have a rational counter-argument. Words might come out of their mouth, but it won't be rational. I can tell you that. Uh, discerning truth, how to spot logical fallacies. Uh, that's a great, great uh, uh, resource in our modern day and age. Evolutionists make logical fallacies, errors in reasoning, left and right. We let them get away with it. We shouldn't. If we love them, we shouldn't. We should, in gentleness, correct them so that they can be saved, ultimately. We have DVDs as well. Some people won't read a book, but they'll watch a movie. Maybe, you know, you say, boy, I wish so-and-so were here. Well, you can get DVDs for them. And uh, Created Cosmos takes you on a tour of the universe. We have that on DVD and Blu-ray. It's a wonderful resource showing you how the universe declares God's glory. We have a, a couple of my uh, other presentations out there on DVD. I've got one on how astronomy reveals creation. Very powerful resource showing that the Big Bang is false, showing you that there's evidence for, for youth in, the ter in terms of the, the science that the planets are not billions of years old. They're thousands. They can't be billions of years old. It shows you why. So stuff like that. Uh, I got another one called The Secret Code of Creation. It's going to show you how God has built uh, beauty, tremendous beauty into numbers. And you, you, it's, it's mind-boggling. I don't even want to give, I don't even want to spoil it by telling you too much about it, but it's a really neat resource. We don't think about God creating numbers, but we didn't create them. And they certainly didn't evolve. It's not like seven used to be three and then it evolved, you know, <laughs> right? It's kind of interesting. You have evolutionary biologists, evolutionary geologists, but when it comes to mathematics, everybody's a creationist. Isn't that interesting? There's no evolutionary mathematics. It just doesn't even work. Uh, we have uh, books on astronomy, that's my area of expertise, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, How to Better Enjoy the Night Sky from a Christian Perspective, great resource. Taking Back Astronomy is a wonderful resource showing you how the universe declares God's glory. And it's a lot of, a lot of full color pictures in there too. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, beautiful resource that you could give to a, maybe a skeptical friend that would maybe help them uh, to think about some of these issues. Uh, we have Acts and Facts, that's our free monthly magazine. How many of you are already getting Acts and Facts? Okay, we have a, a few righteous here, and the rest of you need to repent. And uh, <laughs> it really is a free resource, and it's a great resource. So it's a monthly magazine that we put out that I think will really encourage you in your faith. So please sign up for that. There's, there's no catch. We're just able to do that because of our generous donors. And we want to bless you, and we want to thank you for having us out here as well. Check us out on the web as well, icr.org. I have a blog you might want to check out but as well, but our main website, icr.org, and if we run out of stuff, you can either backorder it or you can get it on our website as well, although we discount it here, so try to get it here first.